first one. It's the launch. Um, and the objective of uh, the series is really to invite notable architects and engineers uh, to come to NOR to speak about the design uh, to NOR staff and friends. The series recognizes that NOR has collaborated, and most of you know that, uh, with a number of uh, outstanding architects and engineers over the years. They've kind of become known as um, signature architects. I'm not sure where that term came from. I don't really like it. Uh, but there are certainly people that are, uh, are renowned and, and definitely are notable. The series recognizes that NOR is an architectural and engineering firm. Uh, there is no fine line between architecture and engineering. It is one and it is design. And I think that uh, we do have to get back to understanding design and talking about design. <clears throat> so in 2008, uh, starting in January, every the first Monday of each month at 4 o'clock, we're going to hold a guest uh, speaker series. Um, and we're just putting together our roster uh, for that. And uh, we'll issue that to, to staff. And uh, plan to be there. Put it in your diaries, uh, in your outlook. Um, and hope to see you there. Our guest speaker today is an architect who has spent, and I'd like to say continues to spend <coughs> his life in the pursuit of, and if most of you have read uh, Tim Collins' Good to Great, um, it's exactly what he's doing. It's not just good architect architecture, but finding great architecture. Norris collaborated with him um, on the world's first uh, stadium with a retractable roof and since that time we've had a relationship <coughs> with him for the, for the last uh, 23, 24 <coughs> years. He's a partner and a friend of NOR. <coughs> Our guest speaker is Rod Robbie and when I asked Rod if he would do this he typically said if you're asking I'll do it. <laughs> Which was very nice of him. Then the second thing I asked him is that I needed a biography, and he said, what's that? <laughs> uh, so he actually sent me a biography, but I edited it. <laughs> so Rod graduated in 1950 and was licensed as an architect in 1951 when he joined the Chief Engineers Department of the Eastern Region British Railways until 1956. During that time, Rod designed a fully flexible modular steel traffic office equipment system, which was used by the British Railway system nationally, and it was still in use <coughs> in the early 1990s. Rod immigrated to Ottawa, Canada, in 1956, where he worked briefly, and I've highlighted briefly, for Public Works of Canada, before joining um, a small architectural practice in Ottawa, Belcourt and Blair. There, Rod designed the Boy Scouts Association headquarters building in Ottawa. The building was the first fully precast concrete office building. It featured modular planning approach to design. It was one of the first air conditioned office buildings in Ottawa. <clears throat> but unfortunately, Rod's days at that firm were limited because he was recruited by Peter Dickinson in 1958 and Rod actually ran the office in Ottawa uh, at that point. He was the lead architect and town planner on the new town for Fulvershire Bay, Baffin Island, the centerpiece of Prime Minister Diefenbaker's Dream of the North. Rod moved to Toronto in 1961, admitting to me recently that he really couldn't hack Otto. Had to get us. <laughs> he was the founding partner when he, when he came to Ottawa of Ashworth, Robbie, Vaughan, Williams, architects, and town planners. And I think that you probably recognize <laughs> a few names in there. I spent some time with Fred Ashworth. Um, uh, at a previous firm, and uh, it was Colin Bond, who uh, most of you know from City TV. 
That firm, like Knorr, uh, went through nine iterations in total and ended up with Robbie Saint Architects uh, in 2004. So if you take a look at Rod Robbie's good to great designs, they include the Canadian Government Pavilion at Expo 67, the Metropolitan Toronto School Board Study of Educational Facilities, otherwise known as SEF, the Toronto Sky Dome, and not to be called in this room, the Rogers Centre. <laughs> His accomplishments are, are many, and as you saw, has a, a, lot, a lot of letters after his name, and he's definitely earned every single one of them. But the one that's probably the, um, uh, sits right at the top next to his name is the Order of Canada. Uh, he holds an honorary doctorate of law from Dalhousie University, is a fellow of Ryerson University, is a fellow of the REIC, He's been awarded the Order of Da Vinci by the OAA. And I would like to ask Rod Robbie, my friend, to come up and speak on his favorite subject, my life as an architect. Please welcome Rod Robbie. Well, well I, found, I found that really quite moving because, A, I don't know anything about design. so. What, what, what this is, is what happens to you if you uh, get recruited into this profession by accident and you end up, you know, half, half a century or more later, it's still doing it because you can't figure out what else you could do. You know, so um, this is about the truth of my life. So what I'm going to start with, I'm going to show you some pictures on here. If I can make this, if just push the thing. Um, you say, well, what the hell's that got to do with architecture? But you see, what I want to do is to say where I came from, uh, because this man didn't tell me about design. He said, just tell us, tell us what happened to you, you know. So anyway, my, all my family were in the British Merchant Marine, and this is one of my uncle's sh ships, or one of my uncles was the chief engineer of this thing, being launched before the war, anyway. And the other thing that was very central to our lives was, again, because of the Merchant Marine um, engines. This is a, a, a triple expansion steam engine, which I knew all about when I was like a, a schoolboy. Um, and my, my fate was going to be to run these things in, in uh, cargo ships. The other person who had a great deal to do with my life was this gentleman, who you probably have all seen before. Um, and uh, the, the problem being that he decided to attack our country and we lived on the south coast so we got the beneficial treatment of his bombing uh, until we blew him away so anyway it was uh, very pleasant of him and the other thing that had a great effect on our, on my life or at least uh, worrying about it was this thing which of course is the bismarck um, which had it got away in the atlantic uh, we would have probably starved to death but uh, it didn't, so, but he, they managed to sink the hood and a few other things along the way, but anyway, it got sunk. Um, now, the other, coming to architecture, um, I should add that I got into architecture, be, we, I was 15, and my mother said, what are you going to do? And I came from a, quite a poorly off family. The, my father was a fitter in a shipyard. My mother had been a barmaid. Um, that's where they met. He was drinking it and she was serving it, you know. <laughs> and uh, then he served something to her and I'm the result, you know. So, so anyway, um, the, uh, the, the upshot was that she said, well, you've got to do something, you know. So, um, you know, and it, my, my imagination, bear in mind the war was on, it was 1944. And the, my imagination, or 43 actually then, ran as far as... Um, you know, working in a shipyard or going to sea as a marine engineer, uh, which I'd been told I wasn't going to be allowed to do by my, my father. So I, uh, apparently the school board, not the school board, but the, the uh, public authority that uh, ran the education system in Southampton, where I came from in the south of England, um, gave away scholarships. And at this particular season, they had two very interesting possibilities. The first was called being a barber, which is cutting men's hair, and of course in those days men didn't wash their hair, 
so it was kind of a smelly occupation. Um, but it didn't, that didn't bother me so much because we all smelled. Um, and the, but the, the other part was, uh, the other idea was architecture. Now the, the trouble with that was that I didn't know what architecture was. Um, so I asked my mother, I was very interested in engineering, particularly bridges. So my mother, I said to my mother, do architects do bridges? She said, of course they do. She didn't have a clue. She just said yes. So I went in for the scholarship and won it, and I'm here. That's how I got here. So um, I went to a place called the Southern College of Art, and there was a German lecturer there who was an emigre from the Bauhaus, and he realized I didn't know what I was doing. And we were in Winchester. We'd been evacuated there to avoid the bombing in Portsmouth, where the school was located. And he said, go and look at this building, which is Winchester Cathedral, and understand the space, the, the structure, the, the, the refinements, you know, the decoration and so on, and the light, and the way the space is organized. Um, I made this drawing when I was about 16 of this building because I spent half my life there. Now this fine building here, um, when I got to the school, the, um, the I discovered that, well, I went to the school late, and the, 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 uh, the rest of them knew what they were doing, and they were like three or four months into the mission. And we were given a job, which was to draw our view, or our idea, of a city hall. This was my idea of a city hall. Um, so it was in December 1944. Um, and the lecturer very kindly described it as a municipal muck heap, which I've always... I've always uh, a treasured, pardon all the crap on this slide, but this, this was typical of the drawings we had to do in that school. This, as you can see, is the Parthenon. This was done in ink and whatever, and it took hours and hours. And we, this was a funny school in that it, uh, it was part of an art school. You would design a building and you had for a library. Um, again, it, it, half the trick was to make these drawings look presentable. This was a typical piece of work in the third year. Um, and it, again, you know, you can see this rather, this rather old-fashioned South of England feel to it. Um, I was conscripted into the British Army, um, you know, because everybody had that fight and you did your national service. And this was, the, this was a sketch I made of the village outside our camp where I was sent to train in the Royal Engineers in surveying, which was mostly a, a, uh, an excuse to spy on all the countries around the canal zone in the Middle East. Um, well, at least I was just a, a private in that organization. However, it did have the enormous advantage that I was able to travel extensively in Egypt and this was a photograph I took with a couple of other guys um, in the southern part of the country. Um, I came out, I got a scholarship to the Rin Street Polytechnic, which was in London, um, and it was a very good school. Uh, there was a small problem, my father was dying, and uh, um, so the program was two years, fourth and fifth year. I got there, I came out of the army, and uh, I made a deal with the chief lecturer at the uh, if I could skip the fourth year and just go to the fifth year, he'd make it easy. Like he, he wouldn't make it easy, but he'd tolerate it. So this, this was my thesis. It was a shipyard, and you have you know a factory and all the rest of it. So then here it is in the model form. Um, also at that time, I was interested in furniture, and another guy and myself designed this chair, which we did in 1950, and it's made of resin bonded fiberglass. It was for a competition for the Festival of Britain, which we didn't win. Um, but it seems sort of reminiscent of one made in the United States, which we didn't even know about at the time. However, he did well, we didn't. Um, <laughs> we, that's about the only one that existed, and Lord knows where it is. Uh, I went on a trip with my wife, who I married in 1952, or we married, I should say, in 1952, and I saw a three-legged chair at El Greco's house in Toledo, in Spain. And this, uh, this thing 
came out of it. I, I wouldn't advise you sit on it. It was entirely unstable. You know, you just lean a bit to the left or right, and you're on your face. You know, um, this uh, at the same time being a workaholic, um, I and my friend both entered the planning school, which was run at night. So this was this was a scheme for a, a housing project in Roehampton, which is in the south part of London, and this was the Elephant and Castle. We were trying to replan it which is a big mess, and it's still a big mess. But you can see, that's where it is in the bend of the river in London. Anyway, this was the first job I did for British <coughs> Rail. It was a <coughs> ticket office on Victoria Street, which I you know, burned my guts out on, as you can imagine, um, with great care. And about uh, 25, 30 years later, I took my daughters down there to, s to show them Daddy's first job. And I couldn't find the building, but more particularly, I couldn't find the street because they'd knocked the whole lot down. The street was gone, the buildings were all gone, they'd re realigned it. It was Victoria Street, so that's a, that's a piece of history. This was another piece. This is inside King's Cross Station where I was working. And on the right here is a piece of the Victorian station that was uh, we attached to. This was uh, the, the railway advertisement for the festival. Um, we we had a very Miesian outlook on what we did at that time, partly because it was simple and partly because it was cheap, um, and we had no money. Uh, this is in one of these dismal railway depots in the east end of London. So this was a canteen. This was our biggest building at the time. Um, this, was, this was the Norwich Thorpe ticket office in uh, Norwich in the eastern part of the country. Again, you can see this sort of very simple thing inside this very ornate Victorian building, which we were trying to integrate it with in some fashion or other uh, without having to go to the cost of the original building. Uh, the other thing I, I got heavily involved in was master planning at that time. This was about 1954, 53. This is the port of Harwich, and this is where the train ferries and cargo ships go from. So all of that, this whole big piece, this little bit down here is the town, but all the rest of it was railway land except for that, that uh, village that we just wrapped all this industrial stuff around. Um, this was the last project I worked on. Uh, this was a slightly ambitious job to join together Euston Station, which is here, uh, Somerstown Goods Yard, where the British Library is now, um, King's Cross Station, which is on the left, and then St Pancras Station, which is the one that's sticking out the front there. And the idea was to join these two railways together. One went up the east side of the country and the other up the west side and put this humongous station in between with a whole mass of development on the roof of it. Of course, being Britain, nothing happened. Um, this, this was typical of the equipment that we were building, which was made of oak and it had a tremendous amount of detail in it inside all these drawers. It doesn't look very impressive because everything was on a very low budget. Uh, and then the last project I worked on was this thing, which seemed to work quite well. This was this containerized furniture system, which was based on these boxes into which you could fit drawers or cupboards. And then into that, you could fit all the multitudinous pieces of paper and stuff that they had to run this railway at the time. And this system, as Silvio mentioned, uh, was still in use about 30 odd years after it was developed. It worked quite well. And it was probably one of the first containerized furniture systems. This was, this was the Boy Scouts headquarters before it got butchered. Um, somebody saw on all the sunbreakers off it. But what I tried to do in this, this building was completely modular. And at British Rail, um, the, the guy who was the deputy architect was a leader in modular construction and was the person who, who metricized the British, the entire British uh, construction system. Um, and so I learned a great deal from this guy. So when I got to Canada, I was very interested in modular construction and systems. And so this thing was based on a, on a, on a four-foot planning grid and a one-foot um, detail grid. Um, and the attempt was to control 
um, summer sunlight to not heat the place up inside too much to run this air conditioning system that was quite a hard thing to get there. Um, and as Silvio mentioned, this building was completely precast except for some stairs which stabilized it. This totem pole was the last one done by a, a chap on Queen Charlotte's Isle, which I unfortunately I can't remember his name. It was the last pole he carved, and it was probably the biggest. And it, they had to use special cars to get it across the country. The CP brought it here. The canopy was not like that after I left the firm. The, the original canopy was a hyperbolic par par paraboloid, uh, but the, the senior partner didn't like that too much, and he was a bit scared of it, so he changed it. Um, this, but as I say, this building is now a, a travesty of what it was. This is the town of Frobisher Bay on Baffin Island. Um, the, 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 the bay is down at the bottom of the picture. Uh, the town site was this thing on the left, and then this was the, this was the uh, Akalawit village. And then this was the extension, the powerhouse and the things. And this is quite a big hill going up with a, there's a radar station on top. But the idea with this thing, it was a chain of buildings which all faced south. Um, it had virtually no, north was up the picture. And so it had virtually no windows on the back. Again, it, it, this was one of these schemes that there was a huge amount of work done on it. And then the government changed again. and. It, like the Arrow Project, it disappeared into no man's land rather quickly when Mr. Pearson won. Um, the next job of any consequence, but in between times I, I, I worked on tons of buildings, but a lot of them were schools, um, a lot of small industrial buildings, uh, and certain amount of residential. But then we won uh, this, which is the Canadian Pavilion Expo, and my colleagues and I, Paul Scholler and Matt Stankiewicz, uh, who were from the two other firms, uh, we had this joint venture to do this job. And we, um, we after a tremendous amount of work, we uh, um, settled on this rectangular 30-degree py pyramid as being the basic unit of space. So they were right way up, upside down, and so on to create the whole building. So this was the final model that was presented to the cabinet for final approval. This is it in the actual thing. So the, the Canadian site is all this in the bottom left of the picture. This is Ontario, Quebec. And then in the middle is Saskatchewan, where the prairie provinces, and then the, the Maritimes and the, and the native people. But you can see these, this pyramidical structure. And the, the idea was to make something that was interesting, but cheap, um, and also would work. This, um, and bear in mind, the, the land was all artificial. It was about 20 odd feet of fill dug out of the subways in Montreal and thrown in the river. And it wasn't consolidated. So th this thing stood on caissons. The rest of it was founded on spread footings in all this, this stuff that was made up the site. So, we had this, which, um, as you can see, just consisted of these four girders, a, a bunch of legs under, and a plate to stop it from exploding. Um, and then the buildings, this, this was at just before it opened. It, you wouldn't believe it, but that was probably only about two weeks before it opened. Um, but they, uh, they, had, uh, they, they built this thing up in, in short order. Um, the, the building, uh, the, the main exhibit was de designed by an exhibit team, so they made these models because we didn't have computer graphics to, to study the exhibit, and they're all made of balsa wood. They're quite elaborate. Um, now, this is the test. Uh, what we figured on is if we could make the building out of wood, a lot of it was glue lamb, um, the bigger members in the real building were glue lamb, and then we used this. Uh, uh, polyvinyl chloride reinforced <coughs> fabric or, or uh, plastic sheet because uh, we wanted to get a building that was translucent and this is a test structure built at the National Research Council in Ottawa to test how it would stand up through a winter because we had to build a building it had to go through a winter and then it had to uh, 
be used. So this is what it looked like on the inside. The panel, the one in the middle, is the one with the fabric on. So it, it made for a very nice soft light. It looks great on here a bit. When it, after it had been there for a few months and years, it got rather filthy. Um, this is what the basic structure looked like. Um, the only thing you can't imagine on here is the temperature. It was about minus 60. You know. there was a, well, not that day, because you can see the steam is going straight up. But it, it, probably then it was about minus 35. But it was rather cold. But then the wind would blow, because this was in the middle of the St. Lawrence River. Um, that's part of our project in the distance. That's the arts building. <coughs> this is what it was like inside. Um, with a brick floor which went all over the entire site and then this plastic covering. And so this, this building cost 6.4 million. It was 11 acres. Um, and it was under budget and it was finished on time. This is inside the restaurant which is in a steel building where we used the same, we used the same motive all through. This is uh, Eskimo carving or Inuit carving on the end wall. Oh, this picture is this is my wife, and these three little girls in yellow outfits are my daughters. And the, the little one on the right, so a few years later, she looked like this. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we, we happened to be, this is how we normally dressed on the weekend, you know. Um, so this, so at, you know, after that, I uh, left the, I was recruited um, to, uh, to take on this project which was a, a, a project to try and find a way of making buildings very quickly for the, um, for the school board because they had a, a tremendous influx of children. They were getting around 43,000 new kids a, a year new to the system and the, the schools were inflexible. This school on the right, this is not a SEF school. This is a brochure that was done before, the, we, before we'd built anything. It was just when it was starting. This happens to be a school we did in, in northern New York State. Um, this funny looking thing here is, was my idea of the organization to, to get it started, you know. So we had all these pompous words at the end there and all this sort of stuff. And actually, in the end, we used a, a PERT system, this great long thing with uh, uh, critical path days, etc. Anyway, the system worked pretty well. It was a huge amount of work, but it, the idea was to try and get wide span buildings um, which would enable us to move anything anywhere. So this was, a, this was the test frame for the, for the first test structure. Um, we had a completely movable electrical system that you could shift around, and this was the heart of it. It was up in the, and it was all plugged in, so the the plugs went into these, these things on the face of those boxes there because the electrical union and the, and the contractors didn't like it too much um, because it meant that laymen could uh, just change the electrical system in a building, you know, they, they just get in there and plug the red to the red and the blue to the blue, etc. Uh, this, this was a furniture system that we developed um, for use in the classrooms which was sort of like this. So it, and th that is the, the lighting ceiling system and the wall system. Uh, it actually looked, uh, oh, we developed these environmental criteria sheets because there was none of this stuff available at that time. So we developed these to uh, work out what we needed. Um, this, this is a interior of one of these schools. All the, all the wall panels are removable. You can take them off individually. So if you want to extend the building. The, the, syst the roof ceiling system, all of it was, was movable. Uh, this, is the, this is where these pogo poles came from. We developed the system of feeding the power from the top down. Um, the partition system was part of it. And then, of course, carpet. It, it, at the time, there was vinyl asbestos flooring everywhere. And we decided, we, or the school board said, you know, we want it so the kids can run around on the crawl around on the floor because we were building mostly elementary schools and so we developed after a tremendous bidding problem with wool and nylon and polypropylene and everything else you can imagine we managed to get this um, but the other thing which came out of this set program 
was packaged air conditioning <coughs> units. Prior to this, they were nasty little tin cans on the roofs of cheap um, malls and places. And so we wanted to get large um, um, multi-zone units which we could move. Um, and so the buildings could be, could be um, made so that they, if they wanted to change the air condition, they could actually t take it off. And GM got a hold of this and they developed from it um, uh, uh, their own sort of package unit not long after for use on, on the car plants or whatever. Uh, and which were these big units because no one had attempted to make these these much higher grade units until we tried it on this program. This was typical of the wall system on the outside. All of this can, all of those panels can be pulled out, pulled out individually if you wanted to. Now, of course, we went too far. Nobody ever used it. You know, like even when we put an extension on a Ceph school, I think we took out one panel. You know, like, so that was a waste of effort. Um, this, um, there's a great deal of wasted effort in architecture, I'll tell you, um, which I'm sure you know. Uh, this, was, um, this was the first um, community college for, for Seneca, uh, the original scheme. And we got this huge job, it was about 42 million uh, at the time, which was in the, in the 60s. I, I was running the SEF program and Colin Vaughan and John Andrews of Sacred Memory in joint venture with Adamson and uh, Mathers and Holmby, our firm and, and the, you know, John Andrews, etc., got this job as a joint venture. And so uh, the plan was that we had this like street with these buildings, and then you could build out laterally from them with either temporary buildings or permanent buildings. So the thing was like a, like a great big octopus thing. Um, the only problem was that both Colin and John Andrews told Dr. Minkler, who was the, pre the, com the new chairman of this college, that he picked the wrong site. And um, Dr. Minkler didn't like that kind of criticism. He was also the head of the York, uh, uh, North York School Board. So he fired us, you know, which uh, quite upset Mathers and Holmby. And they got back in somehow. And then John Parkin, your ex-leader, ex uh, took over this job and he built a building on that awful site and we figured we couldn't find a foundation under about a thousand feet but anyway he found one somewhere built a concrete building I spent a great deal of time when I was younger doing this kind of thing which is this was drawn in Sarajevo before it all got blown up um, and this kind of thing uh, which I'm sure you've all done so um, and this is I spent a certain amount of time in the 70s doing carving and my wife was a painter um, and so she'd paint it, I'd cut it. This, this thing's on the wall in my living room at home, it's like eight feet by four feet. Uh, it's rather massive, it's made of cedar and then that's a piece of it. Um, and this was another one we did um, and th there was a theory behind all these. Oh this thing was I, I, I was heavily involved in politics, so this, the, the idea of this thing was the leader in the lead. These are the lead down here, and here's the leader. Oh, he's off the paint. He's, he's, he's down on the margin of the screen there. It's a little, little red thing with a white top on it, but he has all these, he has all these protections between him and the people. Um, you can see where my views were coming from. Um, this was our entry <coughs> into the Edmonton City Hall competition thing in the middle there um, and uh, it, you know it was it was like supposedly a gateway to the north actually you probably freeze to death with a venturi effect you know fortunately we didn't win um, this was um, this was my entry into the Tête de France competition in Paris which we also didn't win but the interesting thing was that um, I think only the guy who won and myself had this idea of an arch where the axis of Paris would go through and then turn where it went off towards the Seine. So th this idea here was that you'd have these gardens because if you've been to Tete de France or to the De, de France, it's just a mass of concrete and great big concrete buildings and there's like no vegetation there. So I thought it might be an idea to have a little bit. This is the back of it. Um, this. 
Okay, this is where Skydome started. I put these in as it, uh, it's sort of, this was at the planning stage uh, when, it, when it was a planning competition. So I, my thought was that you'd have this, the, the, it was based on a traffic idea of where, trying to figure out where it should be located. And, and this was a, actually if I go forward one and go back and then come back, this was the, this was the plan and I concluded that it should be in the downtown core near the railroad um, and, but in a position where that big black dot is, where it could form the end of a ceremonial route that went from there and then up University Avenue to the legislature. So going backwards, it, so, it, so the idea was that you had this, this thing that you see at the bottom here was this, this main mall coming along and Davis Square and, you know, <laughs> what, how imaginative they, and then some offices. And the, uh, the thing itself would be the, the, the thing there. And the Globe Mail building got nuked. It was buried in the development there. Um, th there's the square. There's the tower. At any rate, there, none of the other people were thinking about putting this thing downtown. But af after the competition, um, IBI suddenly came up with the idea of putting it over next to the tower there, which kind of you know, and the rest is history, as they say. But th this thing was, and the other th idea with this was to try and separate the, the roads in, in level so as to actually get a square to the north of it, uh, which is actually off the, it's off the screen, um, where you could actually get Fort York in the square, so you could actually see it, um, which you can't see on here. Um, so did that, and, and then as you know, we all collaborated together to work on this thing, um, which you've all seen. Um, that was the model for the competition. Um, at that time, it would, tried to use the whole site. This this curvy piece on the front actually used all the available land, and as you know, it all got stripped off as it as it developed. Um, that was the site before we started. Uh, here's the is the water plant and uh, down there with the tower in the middle of it and then there was a roundhouse which has been demolished actually in this picture because there was a great there were two big water pipes come under here and Ellis Don who got that job were digging to put in those pipes and also the pumping station which is on the left by the expressway there um, this is the building of course had a lot of influence on what it did um, um, and uh, which you've all seen, um, went and had a look at it twice. It was remarkably similar in, in many ways. The other was the, the old influence from, from way beyond. And so I thought that you know, maybe the, the basic system would be something like this. And so this was the original scheme, which sucked. It, uh, it, was, it was just like a great big Zeppelin hangar. It was, you know, how you dealt with the end wall, it just didn't make sense. And, so anyway, Michael brilliantly came up with this drawing, which was because we'd been dis trying to decide how you make the thing open and close. And so we had, nesting was, or telescoping rather, was the obvious way. Nesting was, was a function of that. And so by combining the two, you got that. So that was the antecedents of it. And the, the other part was, what shape should it be? Because they wanted to have baseball, um, football, and concerts. And so you ended up with a, a rectangular building laid on this. So it, it really meant it put that on top of there and you had to move the seats and the rest, of course, you know about. This was the relative size of the of Sky Dome and its, uh, and its great grandfather, you know. Um, the, um, this was a, a, a holy moment when the building had some color. Uh, after when it was finished, we got everybody who worked on it to uh, put in a design using the primary colors that we'd used as the color scheme for the building, the interior, um, you know, for, for various recognition purposes. And people came up with their own designs. The only constraint was they couldn't use black or white, well, some white, but not black, and they couldn't, uh, and they couldn't use any other colors except the primaries. So they did this, and these went all around the building, but of course they got lost and disappeared. 
Um, then um, Silvio mentioned we worked together in in Rennes for many years, um, and this was Frankfurt. It was one of the stadiums we 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 actually won it, but it of course went south on us like these things tend to do. Um, this one was very flat because it was in the flight path of Frankfurt's main airport. It had a rollout field, which is rolling out here into another stadium. Um, this was. Manhattan, where we were hired to design a retractable roof stadium to accommodate the Olympics and to accommodate football. And on this scheme, the whole bottom end of the building comes off. You can see where it changes the track only goes so far and it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit further up, so we're up on this side. Um, it was, it, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, my hand where is it? There? Yeah. Oh, all right. Just there. You have to pardon my hand. I, I'm, I'm shaked like a, a, an aspen leaf. So from there down, uh, all of those seats in there were temporary, and then the whole end came away, and it slid on a, on, well, it's in where you see it there, it's in its open position. It's already been pulled back. And when, it, when they finished with the Olympics, the idea was to remove those seats, and then that would push back, leaving this site. However, um, Cone Pedersen Fox got that job, and then Cone Pedersen Fox lost it. You know, <laughs> after we'd had it. So again, it was the the, the story. This was this was Jetta Stadium that we we all worked on together. Um, this one we developed this this retractable roof that spiraled open in two panels. They they would spiral around and, and face each other. In that one would go on the this one would go on the other side and vice versa around these tracks. Um, and we used the same concept for Beijing. This was, I put this in, this was a building. We got a client who wanted us to build an indoor NASCAR track. This track is a mile long inside a building that would seat 177,000. The infield was over a million square feet. Um, the building about 150 feet high it was about, I don't know, two and a half thousand feet long and one and a half thousand feet wide or something. It was a ridiculous scale. Um, however, um, unfortunately, just before he was getting ready to do something about it, he died. So, <laughs> that, you know, there, that was, the, that was the, the way it happens. So it was, it was intriguing. This was a version of it. This was a short track. This one was about th half a mile, three quarters of a mile. Um, and there's the 42 cars battling it out. Um, now, I've st stopped the pictures there, um, and the rest of it I'm going to just say, because, because I come from another century, I don't have PowerPoint or anything like that, and <laughs> you've seen all that before. So the rest of what I did, wh what I worked on, I guess, in my career, um, was a lot of work on life science laboratories, because I was always intrigued by the, the complexity of these things um, and, the, uh, um, and the challenge of, of trying to accommodate these very picky scientists uh, in, some, in some sort of building which uh, might have some flexibility to it, because I've, I've always been very interested in in sort of modular construction and in flexibility and trying to get buildings that you can change around. So there was, um, there was a lot of, uh, did a lot of those and then I think worked on maybe 40 of them. Um, and then of course schools, I worked on about three to 400 schools um, in, uh, over my career. Um, you know, a lot of them obviously is they're repeats or tend to be repeat. But again, I, as, when I was at CEF, I was a, an educational bureaucrat for three and a half years uh, at the Metropolitan Toronto School Board, and which gave me an interesting insight into the other side from where you usually are as an architect. So a lot, a lot of what I've done has been in trying to use um, sort of very rational, almost engineer-like means of arriving at solutions um, for buildings that, when built, will last a long time because 
um, I've always felt that we spend enormous amounts of a client's money to build these buildings and you know the, the least they can expect is that they will last a long time and work very well and hopefully um, not become obsolescent or obsolete which is worse um, very quickly you know so that they can things change and they can mutate and if you think of quite a few old buildings, you know, like really old buildings or old, you know, from 100, 200 years ago, um, there was a tremendous number of these buildings that could survive from one set of functions to something quite different and still have a useful life in the, in the, new, the new period of history. And the other thing, I, I, when I worked on Frobisher, which you saw at that, that town on Baffin Island, um, it was the first time I had an interest in how you might use solar energy to try and save money on heating the space. So the whole town was set up so it faced south and to grab all the sun. And then the north side was virtually windowless because the, the wind came off the pole on that side. It was very, very, very cold. Um, and uh, then from then on, I'd, I'd always taken an interest in, in energy and sustainability and because of, in a funny, strange way, the, the mechanical engineering background from which I came, uh, not in the classic sense, but in this strange beer parlor sense, you know, of the, of the merchant marine, um, that it, there, there was a challenge in trying to make these buildings, in a sense, more responsive um, to the environment they find themselves in, which in a sense is, is very anti-stylistic. Uh, um, and this was born out in, in the 70s. Uh, I was asked and picked a bunch of people, about 18 of us, um, to do a report for the government that was subject to the Official Secrets Act, uh, which was commissioned by Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation and the uh, then Ministry of, of Urban Affairs or some name like that which they had at the federal level which has now disappeared. Um, and basically they, they gave me a piece of paper and it just said we want you to tell us how we can take all the residential accommodation in Canada both existing and new off fossil fuel and use solar. So the answer was immediate, you can't do it, you know, that was easy, you know. Then they said, no, but that's not the answer we want to hear. So you go away and then tell us, like, what can we do and why can't we do it? So from that study, and it was, it was a bizarre kind of study because they wanted it done very quickly. So I just picked people who had a tremendous amount of knowledge about various things. So we, we went through all the engineering disciplines, planning, you know, telecommunications, power generation, da 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 you know, the whole nine yards. And the, the, the idea was what, what is likely to happen and what, what can we do about it? And so it, on the one hand, from a building science point of view, we, we looked for ways that you could save a lot of energy quickly. Um, and we came up with the idea, well, why don't we weather strip all the buildings in Canada? Like, that would surely have quite an effect. You know, and funnily enough, it did. Um, and also the other was the level of ins insulation. But the funny thing, the weather stripping thing or keeping the air out, making buildings airtight in this very cold climate, um, or at least the winter part of it, obviously, is when the heat gets used, that um, th those sort of things found their way into the National Building Code and then into the Provincial Codes. And this was... Uh, we did this study in 1976. Anyway, it sort of went to Ottawa in a printed form and disappeared, you know, which is most things that go to Ottawa disappear, you know. They, they have some big hole where they drop things in, you know, and it's gone. Anyway, so uh, there was a bunch of stuff came out of it, but what I found, one of the things we looked at was built forms. You know, what are the rational built forms for building if you're really going to do something about trying to save energy? You know, you don't have all kinds of glass facing north in Canada. It kind of doesn't, because the sun never shines from the north in Canada. If you take and move it to Australia, then it might shine from the north, you know, but 
not in Canada. So you have buildings with all kind of glass on the north side, but it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me, even if it's funny glass, you know, which is supposed to be good. So it's better not to have any windows. So out of, from this, uh, there were a whole bunch of things like this, like these built forms. Um, um, Arun Sain and I won the first prize in the 1980 competition run by the government on energy, um, which to put some of this stuff, to attempted to put it in practice. But since then, I've, wherever I've had a chance, I've tried to harp to people, why don't we as architects um, come up with an actual architectural vernacular like, and a form of expression, a style, whatever you want to call it, I prefer the word vernacular, which is based on sustainability, based on en starting with energy conservation. The rest you can do, uh, the rest of it is m kind of my judgment, Mickey Mouse, you know, saving bits of wood and so on. But if you could save a ton of energy, especially high level electrical energy, you know, that you need to drive elevators and subway trains and things like that. This would then have some probably beneficial effect. Anyway, so that was, that was one thing that's come out of that, and I'm still involved in that. That's one of the things I'm involved with at Young and Wright. Um, so what I did in, I, I had this firm, Robbie Sane, which basically went bankrupt. You know, we, we, were, we were insolvent, so I had to close it, which is it's always a rather miserable thing to have to do when you get ancient. Um, so we shut that firm down, and then I went to, I had the other firm, Robbie and Wright, <coughs> so I, I just moved my carcass there. Well, it was there already, so I just joined it. Um, so uh, I, uh, uh, I worked there, you know, for quite a few years, and uh, in 2004, when I shut the other firm, a few months later, I handed in all my licenses, um, and I was made chairman emeritus very kindly so I could get a pension. It's not a pension, it's a, it's a salary. So I'm an employee again, it's great. You know, I don't, have, I don't have any insurance or responsibility and nobody phones me and you know, I don't have to do anything. I just come to the office when I feel like it. Uh, unfortunately, it's always 8.30 in or No, it isn't, is it? No, I, I won't lie, it's 9.30 in the morning, yeah. But I go home at six. Anyway, so I, from all of this, um, I in recent years I figured that if there, if there would, was a way of figuring out this vernacular which probably doesn't have very much to do with just about every kind of picture you see in the in, you know in architectural record or you know the the magazines showing you know the latest art gallery or museum or something and most of these buildings have absolutely zero to do, in my judgment, with a responsible approach to getting buildings that will be affordable to operate from an energy standpoint and in the years ahead. Now, you know, you can add water to that and other things, but just starting with energy and using the least of it you can. And a great deal of it comes from urban design, you know, the planning of how these buildings are sited, uh, relative to each other to do with microclimate and also the buildings themselves. So I can see some of you are dropping asleep, so I should shut up fairly soon. Um, <laughs> anyway. Thank you very much. Um, wanted to open it up uh, to questions if we have any questions from the floor. After all that bullshit, no, no. <laughs> interesting time, uh, but um, uh, it, it was interesting that I actually only got to see Rod uh, every, I can't remember if it was Monday night or Tuesday night, Sorry but yeah. Rod and I and Mike Allen would spend, I think we started at 5 o'clock every night and we would go until about, I don't know, 9 or 10, yeah. uh, and then a little bit after that, yeah. but it wasn't working. 
Um, and, it, and it was a, an incredible time. <coughs> I think what you've seen, um, certainly in the presentation, uh, is exactly the way that uh, Rod uh, lives, the way he lives architecture, <coughs> uh, the way he lives his life. And uh, uh, it was an incredible time to go through. I think it was we put in about 60 hour yeah. weeks, and, and nobody really cared, <coughs> and nobody really felt. We had thought we were going to have a very large team, and certainly for myself, I was responsible for the uh, roof. Um, and uh, uh, I think when I started, I, I thought I needed, uh, and this goes to the staffing meetings that we have, I thought we needed uh, you know, 16 people who were going to get it all done in uh, uh, you know, six months and it would be over with. And what we very quickly found out is that uh, the 16 people really did work. Um, and it was incredible that I had Eva and one other lady that worked with me on the roof. And they were the only ones that could actually understand the roof because it was a building that moved. It wasn't a building that was a static object. And trying to understand it was uh, quite, a, quite a piece of itself. Um, anyways, it was, a, it was a great time uh, for us. Uh, we, we, we certainly learned a lot through that. And I just wish that we could actually mentor and take that to that experience to certainly developments in this room or across the entire architectural uh, world. One question that I would have uh, for you, Rod, I mean, you've obviously seen, seen a lot, uh, uh, you've done a lot through your life. I think that your architecture um, certainly is, is different than those signature guys that run around like Carl Sock. His name is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, is, is there anything with respect to design that you think that you would want to certainly encourage the, the younger people? Well, I think first and foremost is... It sounds very trite, you know, is the function, is the usability of the buildings. Um, and they're prevalent. But also, another thing is making these buildings, and you notice I won't, I won't talk about style, because I, I really basically despise it. And, you know, I always have done. I can't see how you can have just about every building coming out of your shop looking the same, you know, which seems to me to happen in certain firms that will be nameless. Um, everything of significance, that buildings are all sort of parodies of one great idea which has been worked over. It's, it seems to me that the buildings are for different owners, of different users in different places. I mean, if they're all in the same country, they're still in different places. Therefore, there are differences which should be reflected. Yeah, they're all buildings, like we're all human beings, but we, we all look a little bit different. Um, that's one part. The other part is that is the, the, the the business of making buildings that will s stay together. I mean, there are buildings like, uh, again, it's the, the situation shall be nameless, but we've been in joint ventures where the other chap is the designer, and the, the materials and method of putting them together is so hokey, you know, and you say, you, you can't do this, this is Canada, it will disintegrate, and especially where the person doing it is Canadian, and you say, well, like, how can you do this? It, uh, so, like, please learn building construction, learn building science, and how these things go together, and to make a, a, a building. Um, and also bear in mind, buildings are, they're supposed to be permanent. It was only recently, you know, in the last 50 years or so, that the idea that a building was a kind of throwaway commodity, 30 years and you've had it and you knock it down, before that, you'd never knock them down. You couldn't afford to. And I don't think we can afford to either, it's social capital. But there's that part. But having said that, it doesn't mean to say you've got to have a lot of dull, mundane looking buildings that have perfect energy conservation and don't leak and all the rest of it. There has to be some way of creating a beautiful architecture that does this. That to me, is that is the challenge I think is how you make a beautiful architecture which is, grows right out of sustainability and grows out of proper use of materials and construction techniques. Um, you know, the other part is, like in our lifetime, 
things like, which unfortunately I bear some responsibility for, creating project management and construction management, which were part of the SEP program. <coughs> but these two in particular, um, and the advent of lawyers and accountants in the construction industry, have been, like, to my mind, a bane. You know, these, my original notion when I was directing SEP was that uh, the construction management is different. This was dealing with generals, but the project management was an architectural responsibility. It wasn't something that was going to be hived off into another kind of occupation who then got between the owner and the architect, which is what has happened. So I would appeal to you, all you younger people, throw them out, get it back, you know. Um, there are various things you've got to get back. You've got to get back project management, you've got to get back urban design, and you've got to get back interiors. Like, they're all part of architecture. Uh, but they've all become specializations, yeah, certainly in my lifetime. And that, I think, those are some of the things. But I would askew um, fashionable architecture. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to do, especially when people award prizes for copying the other guy, you know. But please be original, and please be smart. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any, any other questions? or rather small anonymous jobs, there's tremendous amount of stress. Um, you, you have to work too long, you don't get paid enough, people don't pay their bills, you've got building officials and you know, you name it, representatives of owners who don't quite know what they're doing, uh, bugging your life. So you get all this stuff coming in and you simply have to get used to it. You simply have to be able to go on day after day, week after week, year after year, just saying that's part of the, part of the way it is. It ain't going to get any better. It's, it probably won't get any worse either, I might add. But it's, it's just about an even badness, you know, that just goes on for decades. But, you know, that's, that's what it is. It's the style of our life as architects. And I think if, if you, in a, and you don't have to be sorry for yourself. That's part of the fun. You know, people... When I was younger, what I didn't mention, I, I lived in Ottawa, but I had the opportunity of, of probably being able to have joined at least three development, what turned into development firms of some magnitude at a very senior level when they first started, because, you know, these guys were all around town. So, you know, you could go there, do that, and just, you know, in retrospect, make a huge pot of money. But... And this came back to the, the stress and whatever the rest of it was. Yeah, there was stress working for these guys. But the only thing is you'd, you'd build in your lifetime 400,000 houses. And you, you know, you'd just be like moribund with just drawing the same thing time, at, time again or getting somebody else to draw it. So if you're going to be an architect or if you choose to be an architect or if you choose to stay being an architect, you have to accept that it... It carries with it this responsibility, but also this delight. You know, it is a lot of fun, I've always felt. You know, bad as it is, it's still a lot of fun. And it's better than being a developer or a millionaire running a bank. You know, it, it actually is better because you deal with a lot of differences. You know, they, what they do, they do one thing and they do it well, and then they do it a, a million times. But you've, in the time they've done a million, well, the same thing, you've done a hundred thousand different things, you know, so that this is where the delight is. So yeah, the stress, you have to learn to deal with the stress. There is no way around it. Otherwise, you have to quit because it won't get any better, is, is my, my view. But that's what I did. Thank you. Look at me, I, I, my hands shake, I, everything, <laughs> nothing works, you know. I've had about 15, op no, I haven't, I've had eight operations, you know. <laughs> there are no other questions. I have uh, a drawing that I did when I was 16 years old. You, you showed us your drawing. Yeah. And I'd like to share my drawing with you. <laughs> and, excuse me? Yeah. <coughs> I happened to go to this high school, 
And I found this. I've had it in the uh, basement all of these years. We're, uh, uh, it's a secondary school, and uh, we took drafting. Um, and one of the things that we had to do, obviously, the architecture guys had to distinguish themselves from the electrical guys and the auto shop guys and everyone else. So um, I designed the, uh, uh, the crest, and of course the class uh, selected mine. And I'd like to uh, put it on. It actually still fits. <laughs> <laughs> and it came out of our trip to Expo 67. Holy <laughs> shit. And uh, uh, obviously it won. Everybody see that? Yeah. <laughs> and you can also see that. So. <laughs> um, but it, it, uh, it's something that I've had in my past all these years, and I just pulled it out. Oh, um, Jack. <laughs> I, I never knew that, uh, you know, in 1986 we'd be able to work together. Um, yeah. And as I said, there are only a few buildings in everybody's lifetime that you actually do, that you remember for the rest of your life and you really treasure. And certainly uh, Skydome is one for me. Um, and uh, certainly uh, it was great uh, having worked on that with you. This guy, this guy might add, was the greatest, because he didn't quite tell you what he did. He did all the outside, as well as the roof of the skydome, which just gave the whole miserable thing. They bought it, and then we fought with Bill of Brisbane Brook Bainan about the inside, because they wanted to take it off us, you know, if you remember. It was quite we, a lot we of We can have some more water and talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> this is a small, small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. And I'm going to actually open it for you. Yeah. I didn't know what you were going to talk about. <laughs> so, hopefully you'll be, uh, you'll enjoy this. And it actually has that, uh, Ah, that oh, my dad. <laughs> <laughs> but it has a You can see, I, I only hope that the rest of the speakers who come here talk about architecture in a more expected way than I have. So. Actually, quite, quite honestly, I think that this was a, a great session for our yeah. first session. Um, obviously, as I said at the beginning, this is not just architecture, but it's engineering, uh, and there is no line between the two, and certainly we, we practice it uh, from a day-to-day -day basis, and I think that we have to try to uh, find it again because I think for the last little while we've just been worrying too much about uh, a lot of other things uh, and, and certainly Rod has lived it all of his life and uh, I, mean, I, it, I could see him if he was probably in uh, in Canada as opposed to Ottawa he probably would have gotten a job with Giffels and he'd probably be running their uh, transit uh, right now but I'm glad that you did it. Hell yeah. Rod, uh, yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thanks. You're welcome to come back anytime. Come to have a job.